Hey there, folks. Welcome back to Pretend World's Real People. As always, I'm Tyler, and uh, nothing crazy to catch you up on for this last weekend, outside of the fact that I made a bunch of sugar cookies with my family, and I think I found a calling for decorating said sugar cookies at a rapid-fire pace. Rapid fire mainly being, you know, maybe two minutes a cookie, but that's good, right? I don't I don't know. What is good? Uh <laughs> had had just had a lot of fun this weekend. And um what else? Yeah, nothing nothing crazy, honestly. It's been such a slow month, but January is looking very, very busy. Now, I want to gear up for something I want to start doing, you know, the, the whole reason we started this podcast uh is to talk to people that we know. And uh, talk to people who are, you know, trying to build careers in the performing arts. And I really want to bring the show back to that by bringing on members of the acting studio that I am currently a part of. Starting with a new buddy of mine named Olivia Hendrick. Now, Olivia is an actress and a musician, but she has so many layers to her backstory that I just, I loved listening to, you know, including, you know, having a, a heavy love for performing art and music. And then, you know, graduating college and looking for a professional job and ended up joining, you know, uh, the, the nine to five gig as it were, but then finding her way back to art. So without further ado, let's sit down. Let's have a lovely chat with the amazing Olivia Hendrick. I'm Olivia Hendrick and I'm an actress and musician. Which came first? I'm really interested to see, especially for you, what came before which? Um, so acting, I think, came first technically because one of like I have really early memories being like five years old, knowing that I wanted to be an actress. Um, and so that came first in terms of knowing what I wanted. But uh, mu music was was right there behind as well. I started playing harp when I was six years old. My mom um, had decided just in her sort of wh wherever she was midlife that she was gonna take harp lessons. And then um, she brought home this like rental harp. And I think as a little girl, there was something really attractive about this ethereal angelic instrument. And so mm -hmm. I, I, told her I wanted to take harp lessons. And so then I ended up taking harp lessons all through sort of my early, early childhood up until mm, little, late middle school, early high school. Yeah. Because the harp sounds amazing, but did she have a backup in case she couldn't get the harp? Like was the harmonium she, in play or? She wanted to do the, um, what's it called? It's, um, it's, it's like mallet harp. <laughs> no, it's um, not mallet oh. harp. What is that instrument called that you play like a harp? but it's, it's flat. A dulcimer. She wanted to do dulcimer um, oh initially. And then, yeah. So, but it ended up being harp. And then she brought this rental harp home. And then, yeah, I ended up taking lessons. So, so it, acting came first, but music, you know, was right, kind of right there with it the whole time as well. Yeah. Well, did, uh, I mean, it sounds like your family was like, they're all musically inclined. Is that a thing? Or was your mom just, like you said, in that space where she wanted to learn something new? I think it was like a midlife crisis. I mean, not a crisis, oh. but I no, my, my, my family is not musically inclined. In fact, uh, not even really artistically inclined uh, per se. Um, so yeah, I'm sort of the, the artist of the, of the family, at least in the nuclear family that it is. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and was that like being, the creative person in a family full of people who, you know, think logistically or maybe they're more mathematically inclined. I mean, was there support in your decision to pursue, especially like acting, but music as well to to develop a career? Were you supported in that way or did it kind of feel jumbly at first? It was super supportive. I mean, so the thing with music is that I was just doing it for fun. There was never a part of me that was like, I'm going to be a musician ever. And honestly, to this day, I, I'm in a band, but it's sort of like, a, how did that happen? Kind of, kind of a feeling sometimes for me because I never pursued it in a in a serious way in terms of a career. I was just I wanted to learn how to play the harp, and my my mom was super supportive of that. And then with acting, I was also really supported. So my family, um, middle class family, but very very much of the mindset that you can do anything that you want to do, and so. It, it, which is wonderful, but also in some ways, um, like there's a double-edged sword to that, right? Because 
I was told that I could be an actress if I wanted to. And so I never had a doubt that I could do that. But because I never had a doubt, um, I never thought about anything pragmatic related to acting. And this this is going to make me sound maybe a bit like an idiot. But I, I mean, I was young and naive in such a deep way. I, I went to conservatory in college for, for theater and studied it and got a BFA, full, fully intending to pursue acting as a career. Um, but I hadn't actually considered anything about monetarily how I was going to support myself, um, what having side jobs looked like in conjunction with trying to audition, you know? And um, so when I, when I got out of college and I was like, you know, sort of pushed out of the shoot of this like really safe environment, suddenly faced with real decisions that needed to happen and priorities that were taking precedent over like our, wanting to be this character in the play. I mean, I, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I did not, I just like, I didn't have any tools. And so it was, you know, my family was supportive, but they, they also weren't like, but also think <laughs> about your, you know, I didn't get any, anything pragmatic from them. So uh, yeah, we can get into that if you want to, that, that, that's a whole can of worms for sure. Yeah. We can open up that, that can of worms uh, just a little bit if you want to, as far as uh, sometimes I, I almost wonder, is it easier to have, you know, uh, support in a way of, Hey, you can do this, but X, Y, Z prepare for, you know, that Yeah. when it comes to not having, you know, either, or were you looking to, you know, your, your friends who are also creatives as a way to, you know, kind of find your footing or how did you navigate that? Cause that's a big change coming out of college and going, Oh God, you know, I, I need to make yeah. money. I need to do something. I mean, to be honest, it, that, that like lack of pragmatism that I had as a young person um, has completely shaped where I am today, like so much happened because of that. Um, and it's, it's kind of like the story of, of my acting career. And basically, you know, so to start from the beginning, I've always wanted to be an actress. I don't really have a memory where I didn't want that for myself. Always been very motivated. I went to a performing arts high school where you had to audition to get in. So I, I majored in theater I also majored in orchestra for the first year. Um, I didn't get into the theater program the first year. It was a middle school and a high school. So for eighth grade, I studied harp there. And then I auditioned a second time to get into the theater program and I got in. So I, I mean, I was like hyper-focused on acting. There was never a doubt in my mind that that was my future. There's nothing else that I wanted. And, and I held it so high. I mean, it was everything to me. Um, and then I got into a conservatory on the East Coast. I studied for years. Uh, I did well. I mean, like I had a lot of, uh, validation and sort of positive feedback that like, you can do this. This is something you can do. Um, keep going, that kind of thing. And at, after I graduated, uh, there, <laughs> I, this is going to sound really crazy, but I had never really experienced true anxiety before my last year of college. I just hadn't, it just wasn't something that had happened in my life. I was a very carefree person things worked out for me, everything was good. Um, and then I graduated and, and, and very quickly realized that I hadn't thought about a lot of really, really important things, um, including how to make a living, how I was gonna fit acting in. Um, and I think I felt supported by friends. I felt supported by family. There was no lack of support. Um, I think it was actually an, the issue for me came up around perfectionism and around the fact that I had made, made acting my everything. So I didn't have other, um, any other interests I had were like so secondary to acting that I always, I thought about it. Like if I fail at this, then, you know, it felt like the world would end or I would split apart or something terrible would happen. Like it was, it was my whole identity. And so to not be able to be that, it felt like a complete, I mean, it was very dramatic. I, you know, I was like, whatever 20 21 um anyway so I I essentially more or less quit acting I I came back home after college I got an agency uh here in town and didn't really have any great success with bookings or anything like that um my mindset was just I like was fundamentally not prepared for the fact that this is a business that just hadn't entered my mindset and I and it kind of came all at once and I felt very overwhelmed by 
by that. And, and so I had to quickly like sort of learn all these things. But at the same time, I was working like three jobs in the service industry, just trying to like get by. Then my student loans kicked in six months after call, you know, so it was like all this stuff culminated. Um, and then just like personal stuff, my relationship I was trying to sort of shake out how I was prioritizing my career and my relationships. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I was really overwhelmed. And uh, it was really, really, really a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear. Um, and that my reaction to that was to shut down and to close off and to say, well, this is going to hurt me too much if I try. So I'm not going to try anymore. And so I, I use the word quit, which feels like a strong word. Like I acted here and there, but I wasn't, I wasn't going for it. You know, I wasn't, um, I didn't, I didn't have that grit that, that makes you push through, you know, not getting an audition, which is now I look back and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like <laughs> every, <laughs> you don't get them. You don't get the audition. That's how that goes. You know, that's the job. Um, but I just, yeah, I, I didn't have that knowledge when I was 21. Um, so. Yeah, it, it's, I've heard that a lot from those who start really early, uh, just wanting to do it and not having the, you know, the real world knowledge or backing of, of getting into it. Because it's, it's one of the hardest industries to get into, right? I mean, it's, I, I can only equate it to, like, I didn't want to do this when I was growing up. I, I fell into this. I wanted to be a comic book artist. And I experienced the same thing after high school where I was like, oh, this is so much harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> like, uh, you're looking at portfolios and going, my stuff looks nothing like what this person's shading is or, you know, things like that. But I'm glad you you came back to it because it seemed like it, it was almost still part of your calling where you you needed a break, essentially, um, focus on you, gain some real life experience, you know, work your butt off, go make music. And then come back to it when you have this sort of, um, I guess, this grounded version of who you are, which is yeah. you know, something we don't find until our late 20s, early 30s, right? Like, well, you think we're grown adults by 21 and you go, no. I don't know shit. <laughs> I don't know anything. Yeah, uh, that, that, that sums it up. You know, I essentially, I, I was very lost. Um, and then... The, it's looking back now, you know, I can sort of spin it and say that it was definitely, it was what needed to happen. And that's true. I mean, but I, there was a lot of shame, you know, and a lot of envy. It was like, it was a dark time. It really was. It was like, you know, just me sort of having to deal with like real fucking shit for the first time um, in a way it just was very affecting. And and so, yeah, I, I like did other stuff. I got into other creative endeavors I needed to fill that void no matter what. I mean, that was something that was very apparent to me was that I felt, I mean, this is, we're, we're going a little dark here, but like, I felt dead inside when I didn't have a creative outlet of some kind. Acting was the one that was and is the most fulfilling, but I, if I didn't have something that I was making or creating. Um, it, that, that just doesn't work for me. So I I I, pers I got into like um, coding, which was a fun weird. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I went to. I like this was that sort of like my peak. Like, what am I doing with my life? Um, sort of time, and I was like, "Fuck it, I'll go to a full stack boot camp and learn how to be a, an engineer." That'll. That, let's just see. Like, I was like in that mindset of like, well, I don't know. Maybe that'll be fun. Um, so I did that. I was honestly like pretty terrible at it, but I pushed through um, and I got like a job as an engineer. Um, and I just, I just really was miserable. I just, it's not fun for me <laughs> to, to do that kind of work. I was, it's very left brained. There's nothing right brained about it. Um, and so it was hard. It was, it was a, the most academically challenging thing I've ever done. Um, and then I sort of pivoted and got into uh, my day job, which is as a user experience designer. So I, I pay the bills with that. And it's a, it's a creative um, outlet that also is monetarily fulfilling. And I have to say financial stability has been a big reason that I felt ready and able to come back to acting. Um, I didn't realize how much of a stress it, it was on me when I was younger, but knowing that I have money in the bank like 
you know, letting go of the sort of preciousness of acting and not having it be my everything was one part of it. And then knowing that like, I'll be okay. <laughs> if, <laughs> you know, nothing bad's going to happen if I don't get this audition. Cause I, I took care, I took care of my, my business, you know? Yeah. That, you know, that hits home for me as well. A few years ago, I wasn't diving into this as hard as I have been. And that is because of financial instability where you're, <laughs> you have $500 to your name and $800 in rent if you're lucky because you're sharing a house with a bunch of people and you have to, to make things happen. But that, <laughs> so I need to go back to the, the coding part for you because that's <laughs> like you, because you said, oh, you know, creative endeavors. And I'm thinking like, I've talked to so many coders and they're, they're funny people, but it's a very different type of funny, you know, <laughs> where it's, it's all logical. Uh, but that's, I mean, I commend you for going through the boot camp because that's, that's no joke. I have friends going through it right now. It's, it's insane, but you know, your current job, are you able to work, you know, remotely most of the week? So you can do self tapes and auditions if you have to, or are you in the office all day? Well, so to be, to be fully honest, I was laid off a couple of weeks ago. Um, my company shut down entirely. Um, but pre they, yeah, it was, they closed their doors because the mortgage industry and it's a mortgage tech company. Um, but previous to that, I was at this company for four years. It was my first, um, nine to five desk job. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've only gotten back into acting since like August. Right. So I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm just popping back in, but even since the, you know, the last, just the last three months that I've had, um, sort of juggling work with acting, it, it works because, you know, now everything's remote. Um, and with tech jobs, um, if you, you, you may know this, but it, it's a very inflated industry. So, um, the pay is, is really nice, but that doesn't always mean necessarily that you're like glued to your computer working every second. It's a very sort of like, it's just a competitive industry. So they pay you well, and then you get the work done. And as long as you get your work done in the week, I mean, no one's monitoring you you and I hope no one from my old company is listening to me but it was really really ideal because I I was able to have a really really nice work-life balance um that yeah allowed me to audition I was a little bit nervous thinking about how if things started to get real and picked up that type of thing I was like well we'll see um yeah yeah and it I mean it's working incredibly well in the short amount of time that you've come back to it you know for those of you listening we're in the same acting studio that I will not name uh because we love it and we like keeping it you know uh <laughs> nice nice and and um how did Brian say it uh just you know keeping it business oriented Intimate. yeah intimate yeah yeah uh <laughs> but if those of you who are listening she's Olivia's an incredible actress and I can only imagine where she's going to go you know, this time next year, given the way everything has been with the workshops and the classes and everything, it, you're just, you're, you're on fire. It, and that's why I wanted to get you onto the show because I've seen you perform, you know, we've talked to him there in class, but getting to know like more about you when it comes to, you know, anything outside of your life in art. I mean, what do you like to do outside of music, outside of acting? What, what keeps you whole at home? You know, what keeps you happy in your personal life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that was kind of another huge discovery for me, sort of bringing it back to acting, is that I do have other things I love, turns out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in some cases, I think this has been the most shocking discovery, is that I actually have something that I care about more than acting, which is my family. And that was, which is my family being my husband, mm -hmm. You know, my brother, my parents, but you know, my dogs, my cat, sort of my immediate family that um, I'm with every day. And I think, you know, that's, if I was, I'm not going to get emotional, so I won't go too deep into this. But, <laughs> I mean, that's, acting is great, but like, I, I would take them over an acting career at any day of the week if I was forced to choose, God forbid, but, um, you know. So I think discovering that, you know, I, I, I love spending time with the people that I love and the animals that I love. Um, and yeah, I, I, I took up baking in 2017. So yeah, that's, this is again, sort of, it, it all culminates with me coming back to acting, but essentially <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, I, I kind of want to get back into acting. Like maybe this is maybe like five years ago, like, yeah, you know, I kind of want to get back into acting. That'd be fun. 
And then, you know, like a year passes and I do absolutely nothing to, you know, actually further that goal. Um, and that, that pattern continues for like several years of me just sort of talking bullshit, and like not following <laughs> through, um, which is, you know, another lesson that I could talk about in terms of actually being ready for something versus saying you're ready for something. Um, but baking sort of filled that creative void that I was talking about. So I, t I started watching the Great British Baking Show and I was like, this, I need, I have, to, I have to make this, this cake right now. And so I like very quickly picked up a baking habit and I got really into like kind of more like the patisserie side of things, like fancy mm -hmm. stuff. I didn't want to just like make a, like a, like a little brownie, you know, I wanted to do like the ultimate, what's the hardest thing I can do? Like what, what kind of frost, there's so many types of frostings and they're like 12 step process is like let me get into that and so the sort of like there's a I do have an analytical side like I'm a creative person but I I definitely love um science-based things I guess and for me baking is very like it's very specific in the steps you have to follow them each one in succession you know there's not a lot of margin for error especially when you're getting into some of the more fancy patisserie type stuff um so that so yeah I love to bake um, I love making macarons. I love uh, making, I don't know, I like making scones, which isn't, no one cares about scones, but I think they're really underrated. I think they're so good because you can uh, have them any time of the day. I care about scones. You care about scones? I'm oh, glad to hear it, man. Dude, you, uh, okay. Yeah, you have no idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I agree. They're very underrated, you know, baked good. Are. I think we need to bring scone. <laughs> forward you know into a position of prominence <laughs> an important baked good um yeah so anyway baking baking is huge for me i i gardening i've recently gotten into gardening so like growing my own food and just di diy stuff like I, I love design so i'm all about just making my own furniture and sort of like weird just weird uh home interior design type things like i love to just get really into that um, and then the UX design, honestly, my, as, what I daylight as I enjoy, it's fun. It's, it's a f also kind of very, very process oriented yet creative endeavor. And I think that that blend is, um, I really enjoy that blend. So. And, and forgive me if, if I am ill-informed of, of that position, but you are designing the, uh, client customer portal for businesses right or yeah, designing that, that experience yeah, so like applications websites okay. desktop app, apps that type of thing so yeah like uh before any engineer touches anything there's someone with sort of the aesthetic eye who's going in and thinking about not just what it looks like in terms of colors and branding but also what that experience is like for a user so um you don't notice ux design unless it's bad essentially <laughs> is how that goes like if you're, if you're frustrated by a website or you think that clicking something is going to take you to this place and it doesn't, or you're nav trying to navigate a site and you're like, where is that? Where's the thing I'm looking for? That's a poor user experience design. But when everything goes your way, you get, you do whatever your task is, and then you move on with your life. That's a good user experience design. And it, it's very subtle. So you don't really think about it unless, unless it's bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> government websites. Yeah, oh god. <laughs> Just I am imagining you though like in a coffee shop overhearing somebody talking about the uh customer portal that you designed like years ago and just like a a proud artist keeping yourself going, "Hmm. Yeah. Yes, that was easy, wasn't it? Hmm. First name, it. last name." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I do want to venture into the knuckle pups. Uh, your, your band, I, like I told you in class, like weeks ago, I love your music. It just reminds me of, um, a mix of like hop along and a little bit of, a little bit of, a of mice and men, you know, this like really just delightful melodic tune you can listen to all day, every day. Uh, how did you guys get together? When, when did that start for you? Yeah. Um, so knuckle pups was, um, the 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 lead the, the what's it called the front man the front man of the band his name's Oliver and uh me and his sister went to elementary school together we were in the same grade 
And I would was babysat babysat by his mom when I was like a kid, sometimes after school. Um, and so Oliver was sort of like the older brother of a friend of mine in elementary school that I knew of. And as we grow up, we grew up here in Denver. Um, we would see each other at like parties or like concerts or that type of thing. Like we had some overlap in the people that we knew. And so we weren't friends, but um, it was one of those things where we always said hi and like whatever. Um, and then we'd go our merry ways. And then I ran into him in a bar in 2018. I was out with some friends and he was like, hey, Olivia, do you want to be in my, my band? <laughs> I was <laughs> like, sure. <laughs> and so that was how that started. It was quite simple. And then, I mean, there was more to it. Like I had to do a trial and stuff like that. But the the Knuckle Pups at that time was really just writing and um, the momentum hadn't really caught on yet. And so I joined the band and um, I think we practiced for maybe a full year and a half um, or maybe just a year before we played our first show, I want to wow. say. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, I think that's I think that's right. Maybe nine months, something something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then we, we sort of added on a couple more members. So this guy named Cello, who at the time played bass, but now he plays lead guitar, and this gal named Coco. Um, and she she plays the bass now and she's an amazing songwriter in her own right just she has like her own solo project she does and then Tomas who's the drummer he was in the he's always been in the band he's been like he's an OG member um, and so that's sort of the crew and uh, yeah it's sort of it's grown really organically which has been so lovely because the band I think first and foremost we there are certain things that we sort of diverge on in terms of like what the direction of the the band is or, or um how much we should be playing shows versus writing versus you know there's sort of the dynamics of figuring that out with a group of five but one thing we all agree on is that that the music doesn't matter nearly as much as the friendships do so again kind of going back to like the relationships are kind of it and then if you can have stuff on top of that foundation chef's kiss but if you don't have that then it's like well that, like you know this is fun but you know the joy is in is in the fact that we like really like each other and we're friends and we, we like hanging out with each other and we're all very um we all bring a different energy to the group um and it's just very chaotic and sort of there's a very sort of like flying by the seat of our pants mentality which started as being simply that and has now kind of become our brand like that we embody a sort of like well we're here we're playing okay like you know <laughs> like there's not um it, again it's not precious it's a it's fun and I think that that I hope that that comes through comes through the music because um yeah it's, it's not like a bunch of you know rock star people with egos deciding this and that and needing things to be a certain way like that is not what happens there's a lot of uh a lot of making fun of each other and you know it's very collaborative which is really really lovely you know what i think uh having served at breweries for the last i don't know eight years i honestly see that type of band overwhelmingly you know like pushing out those bands who are really pretentious and you know just full of um showmanship that kind of thing you know where it is like every band i've talked to in the last couple of years they're just they're funny they like giving each other shit and then maybe they'll play a song here and there and they're just they're there to have a good time and honestly i see that from your your from your music videos you know, uh soft attraction is probably like my favorite one uh yeah. song and video uh and i do have to ask was that an illegal recording that uh that took place or at lakeside yeah that, that was lakeside right Wait, illegal in the sense that we weren't allowed to have video cameras at Lakeside? I don't know. I, I don't think there's any rules at Lakeside anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's like energy. That, like, is this roller coaster going to, am I going to die? Right, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, um, I, I, you know, I guess I never even thought about it, but if it had been illegal or, yeah. you know, against their rules, we would have, it would have probably just inspired us to do it even more. Yeah. You know, like a little bit of that, like, pseudo anarcho like yeah we're crazy but like it's really wholesome and we're not actually doing anything yeah. bad. well that's yeah. why i love that because the shots the composition everything done in that video huh 
this seems like super genius and very gorilla. I wonder if there's a, like if it's against lakeside policy. Because I didn't know it was on lakeside for a second. Like this could be yeah. anywhere. This could be Bush Gardens. I don't know, but it it just it looked awesome. So sorry, as a a, a video nerd, I had to ask that. Uh, but I do want to, you know, dive into, we've been talking about your acting, you know, I want to dive into your, your acting experience, you know, your experience in the theater. Uh, I saw that you were in Rent-A-Pal. I, I do want to, to chat about that. So actually, let's just talk about your first time on like a film set. What was that like for you? Did it feel crazy different compared to theater? Did you find comfort right away? Like, what what was that like? Oh, I loved it. So I was um, my senior year of high school. At, I went to a performing arts school here in town. So I had been doing nothing but theater up until this point, just like shows, and you know, for one show a semester or two shows or a semester, whatever it was. Um, and then, yeah, that audition came through. I think they, I think they were, they had cast most of it and they were looking for the last final roles. And so they were going and they needed to find high schoolers because the whole movie it's kind of like the breakfast club, but set at woodshop detention is sort of the um, the premise of this film that I ended up being in. It's called Woodshop. Um, it had Jesse Ventura, who is like a WWE, former WWE wrestler. And then I think he was also the governor of Missouri. Don't quote me, but he was the governor of, a, yeah. of a, one of the Great Lakes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was in it. And then um, Mitch Pileggi was in it and Don S. Davis were in it too. They had some sort of, um, just like some supporting roles. Um, but, so it was really cool. I I came in kind of not knowing anything because they just came to, D to DSA, the high school I went to, um, and were looking for kids and they picked me up and I had a lead role in that and I had the best time. It was an ultra low budget film it was um filmed at this private um school up in Lafayette and the director's son went there and so he was able to like get access to the entire school and use the wood shop and the whole thing so it was like the best time of my life I ended up meeting my husband on that set who I'm I'm married to <laughs> this was That's back awesome. when I, yeah when I was 18 years old so um we he he played like the stoner like genius stoner genius kid who like ends up saving the day but he's like so high and then I played kind of like a trailer trash sassy love interest of the of the lead um and yeah I don't know we hit it off but it so it was a it was a fantastic experience I felt very comfortable being on camera I also had zero experience and I'm wondering if that was kind of like a it was perfect because I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about film as like, oh, film, you know, I was like, oh, cool, film, okay, like, here I am, you know, and so I just sort of showed up, um, and yeah, it was great, and it, it, I think it was on Netflix for a little bit, and like, there was some, like, distribution that happened, and um, yeah, I had a, I had a great time, so that was my first film experience, and I loved it, and I think I've always known, probably since then, that I wanted to get into film more than more than theater which is what I had done previously so and it sounds like it was a fantastic project to be a part of for your first you know on-screen role that's oh gosh, fantastic really supportive yeah I really supportive really sort of because it was mostly mostly kids who were like 18 17 18 years old so there was a lot of a lot of um conscientiousness it was a very intentional mm -hmm. set it wasn't and it was a kind of a precious baby for the director and the producer they you know they had been holding on to it for some time and so it was really really special for them to be able to actually see it come to fruition wow you know what i am interested because as time goes on especially if you take a break from this industry your perspective changes it's something we were talking about in class last night <laughs> i keep referring back to to brian but uh you know what we want at 18 is different than what we want in our 30s so how has your perspective changed now compared to when you're 18, as far as, you know, what you want from an acting career now that you're dialing back into it and, and fully embracing it, has things changed? Do you have a new goal set that you want to reach? Like what, what's yeah. that like for you? I, I think, I think I've just become really specific in what I want. Um, and like when I was younger, it would have just been like, I want to act in films. <laughs> 
you know, period. Like there, I hadn't, it was just sort of this like nebulous grand dream, you know? Um, and now my goals are really, really, they're small and specific and actually attainable. And I also, I think what's changed, I think is just having more knowledge. I think I've, I've realized just in the last two years that arming myself with knowledge is the difference between staying in this career and not staying in this career. Because when you know that if you don't get this role, that that is not a reflection on your talent or your worth, your value as a human being, God forbid, which is when I was younger, it was like that. Mm-hmm. Or when you, when you know that you can act when you're 70, that this career never ends, that you never have to retire. And that in some cases, in a lot of cases, I think the older you get, the more interesting opportunities start to arise. I mean, I, I, I think that my goals are more just sort of like, oh, I just want to act. And, you know, for this next year, I know that I want to, I want to land a co-star on a major TV series. That's my goal. That's it. Like I have other goals, but like, that's sort of like, let me get that. And then, and then I can move on from there. Right. But I want, I want to have something on a professional set that, and it could be a larger role too, but you know, let's co-star. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but let, let me get that. And, um, and, and, and then let me see what happens after that. And I think another thing that's changed for me that I'm still not sure about is where, where I want to be. Um, I think for a long time, I was like, LA's it, LA's it, LA's it. And in some ways, there's still a part of me that wants, would love to live. I love LA. So not even just besides acting, like I just love LA. So I would love to live there. Um, but, but I'm also like, or I could not, I don't know. The world's changed after COVID, you know? And yeah. um I follow this, this woman, her name is Audrey Moore. You might've heard of her. She has a podcast called Audrey Helps Act. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Let me just side note. This podcast has changed my, it's changed my life. It's, it is the catalyst that has made me step back into this career in a serious mm-hmm. way. Like she's just a gold mine of knowledge. I can't recommend this podcast enough to anyone listening to you, to everyone. Um, but anyway, she, she interviews lots of different actors and there are a couple of them that work, you know, they're professional actors. They're working all the time in Los Angeles or wherever Canada, major film sets, major TV shows. And they have made the decision to live in Oregon or or to live in these States where, you know, you can maybe afford the rent better, or maybe they want a bit of land, or maybe they want, they have a family and they want to raise that family, not, in Los Angeles or not in New York city or wherever. Um, and so that is something that's kind of is changing currently is, Oh, I don't have, Oh, I don't have to be in LA, you know, yeah. or, in New, or New York or wherever. Um, so what does that, what does that look like? Like, you know, but how, how would I do that? If, if my career were to, to have me traveling a lot, you know, like sort of finding that again, just finding that work-life balance, I think is more important to me than it ever was when I was younger. And so making sure that I, I am always making those adjustments and making everything feel good is really important to me, which means that, yeah, maybe it won't, maybe it won't be LA. I don't know. Still deciding. (laughs) (laughs) I think, yeah, we're, we're all at that point right now where, you know, we could visit LA and maybe explore that possibility. But the fact that, we can send in self tapes to any production in any region right now from Colorado is, is a blessing. And it sucks. We had to suffer a pandemic to get to that point. Uh, but yeah, the, the world is essentially our oyster. Now we just have to make sure we, we give it our all in, in each tape. And uh, you know, with the, with the, the very colorful life that you've had and all these different, you know, things you've uh, launched into all these different creative endeavors I am curious uh, what you'll have to say for this next question as we start wrapping up, Uh, but it's if you have a party story you could share with our listeners. So something that stands out so immensely in your life that it could be, uh, it could be tragic, could be funny, could be horrific. It could just be something insane, but something you could easily recant at a party. Do you have something uh, in your arsenal you could tell our listeners about? I I have a music one and an acting one. So do you want music or acting? Let's do both. Okay. 
Um, <laughs> okay, so they're both they're both very embarrassing, and so I hope oh, yes. no one judges me too much. <laughs> um, okay, so my my music one is um, so one time this is like the first show we played after the pandemic had sort of not fizzled out, but their concerts were happening again. Um, and so we had a show, this was like July, 2021. So like a year and a half ago. And we were so excited because it had been so long since we played a show and we were amped up. Like we had a lot of energy. We're like, let's do we, we had all put our hands in the center and we were like, yeah, let's do that. We we're so excited. Um, we had a huge crowd turn up because people were so ready, you know, to be out in, in the world again. So there was, it was like a, the show was buzzy and we got up on stage to set up. I open up, I played this thing, I play a synthesizer. It's called an Omni chord and it looks kind of like, um, like an eighties electronic harpsichord. Um, anyway, it's look it up if you're interested. It's a very interesting <laughs> instrument. Um, so I like open up my box to take my Omni chord out and it's not there in the box. And we're on stage, like literally going to play in five minutes, just like setting up. And I'm like, Oh my God, I left it at home. Like I had taken it out to do, do whatever. I, I, I don't know. And I forgot to put it back in the box and my heart just starts racing. And so just to like, you know, preface this, like as an actor, I don't know if you ever had this dream, like doing theater shows or whatever, or just knowing that you have like a big thing coming up where you're performing on stage or on film and you don't know your lines or for some reason you can't say them or you're naked or like whatever it is it's that 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 feeling of just like you're underprepared and it, everything's a failure so it's like a nightmare right like this is like a, a performer's nightmare <laughs> literally happened to me and it was all my fault so I'm up there just like oh shit oh no oh what are we gonna do um and so I called I called my husband and I was like, oh my God, please, you have to help me. And he's like asleep. He like was had already got, because we were like playing late. And I was like, please, you have to, you have to bring, you have to bring. <laughs> like I was having a day. Um, and so the the venue people were kind of a little bit cranky, which is um, mm -hmm. sort of par for the course a lot of the times. And and they were like, it's, you're on, it's time, it's time to go. And so I had to pretend to, because I, I have like an army cord and then I also have an iPad. So I had to pretend to play on on the iPad and be like, yeah, I'm just playing my, I'm just doing this, but there was no sound. Um, and then maybe like four songs in, my husband came and he like delivered it to me. And then we set it up real quick and we had like an awkward moment of me like, like Coco's telling joke, like bad, like, like bad jokes. And I was like, <laughs> trying to like, like sweating, like flop sweating. Anyway, and so... <laughs> We couldn't even get the sound, like the sound didn't work. So it, it, it was a complete waste because we never actually got it hooked up properly. And so then I just continued to pretend to play my instrument and it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. And now every time before a show, even though I know my stuff is in the, in where it should be, I like double check it. I like really make sure I have everything because it was so embarrassing. It was the worst. <laughs> That's my music party story. Possibly the worst thing that could happen for a musician. Quite possibly not have your instrument <laughs> as a musician. It's like, wow, it's kind of. Oh there. my God. <laughs> That's so yeah. horrible. <laughs> well, at least you you pretended and you, you know, yeah. you guys made fun out of it. You know? Yeah, it was like, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think it was fine. I'm sure it was yeah. a terrible show, but I think it was whatever. It's, it's done. We don't oh, yeah. have to think about it. Again. <laughs> yeah. And what about your, your acting story? Okay, my acting story is. Um, can you hear me? My heat, my heater just turned on. Oh yeah, yeah. It just sound. It just adds this like soothing nature. Oh, lovely. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, my my acting story is. Uh, I used to work at this restaurant up in Boulder, Colorado. I was a server, um, and it was. Should I say names? Am I allowed to say names on your show? You can say names. Yeah. Okay, so I worked at this restaurant called Pizzeria Locale. There's now both, there's all the like quick ones down here, but yeah, the original location is like an actual pizzeria, um, sit down style, and they're they share a kitchen with the same owners as Frasca Food and Wine, which is like a Michelin star rated. It's like a very fancy restaurant in Boulder. Um, and I found out that Robin Williams was coming in to dine at Frasca. 
he had, I think some, I think he was doing, he was like speaking at CU or something like that. I don't know exactly why he was in town, but I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, I got, um, I got off my shift early, I think around like 9.30 or something like that. And I just had it in my head that I was going to just go. I don't, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I like needed to go eat at Frosca yeah. at the same time that Robin Williams was there. Like I needed to do that. And I didn't really tell anyone I was doing it. I like took off my uniform. And I put on my phone and I came in through the main door and I was like table for one. And I like sat down and I think I had, I had this big glass of red wine and then I ate um, sweet bread, this like really fancy, which is brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like crazy. Anyway, that's what we did. So I was like eating brain and drinking wine and like very quick. I don't think I had had dinner. So I very quickly was feeling the wine. And Robin Williams was, you know, whatever, 10 feet away. And I was trying to think about whether I wanted to say something, like say something to him. Um, and then I got it in my head. I, I this like these people recognized him that were. Um, pretty pretty drunk and you know the, the clientele of Frosca is such that like you're an important person if you th if you're there essentially or you're maybe it's a, a special occasion but um, these people very sort of they were very obtuse in some ways like they just came up and they were like Robin can we get a photo with you just like loud and glaring and he he was like very um he, he I, I don't know I don't know how he did it I mean, I guess, you know, it's kind of dark, but like, yeah, maybe he, it didn't, maybe that was a part of things, but they kind of like bombarded him and didn't really ask his permission and like, just started like taking pictures with him. It was like a whole thing. And then I had wanted to say something and I was like, oh yeah, no, okay, I won't. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted him to know like what he meant to me as an actor. And so I uh, like, I like paid, I like closed out. And then I wrote this note on the back of the receipt that was like, dear Robin Williams, my name is Olivia. I am an aspiring actress. And I want you to know that your work, I think I referenced Pan of all the films that he's done. I referenced Pan. Um, Cause I, I don't know. I really liked seeing him in that role for whatever reason. It touched me when I was younger, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. So um, I talked about just like what an inspiration he was in, um, how much I looked up to him, whatever, just like actor fan girl stuff. And and then he went to the restroom and then I like delivered the receipt to his agent or assistant or whoever he was with. Um, and I think I could tell from the look on her face that she was, uh, she was like tired of this, you know, like, yeah. okay, thank you. Like, leave, you know, and I immediately was like, ah, oh, did I? Did I not, you know, I was like questioning it, whatever. Um, and then I found out like the next morning, bright and early, that I I was like called into my restaurant, um, and my manager took me aside because it's like like VIP people come to Frosca, so like the reputation of the wait staff not making a big deal out of like celebrities or basketball stars or like prominent doctors, like there's all these whatever important people in their industries that come there. And I had sort of like embarrassed the restaurant. And so they, they, they gave me, you get like three strikes before you get fired at this restaurant. So they, they were like, you're getting all three strikes right now. If you take one toe out of line, you're out of here. <laughs> they were like, you're fired. The only reason we're not firing you on the spot is because you weren't wearing your uniform. And so there was no association of you working there to like what you did, that it was unacceptable for you to approach that table to in any way treat him like a fan, like all this stuff, like rained oh. down on me. And it, I was just like completely shamed. Um, which like, I mean, I don't know. I honestly, it was a little intense, but I understand. Yeah. Um, and, and then they like, didn't trust me after that. Sean Penn came into Pizzeria Locale, who's working on some film here. And it was my table. <laughs> so I was like, but I like knew, I was like, it's, I'll be chill. I'm chill. Yeah. I'm really chill. Fuck, really chill about this. And, <laughs> and they were like straight up were like, we'll take that table, Olivia. Don't you can cut. They like wouldn't let me have the table because they thought that I would like fangirl out on Sean Penn, even though I had no intention of doing so. Um, but I was sort of like not trusted after that point. And so anyway, that's my other that's my other party story. I guess I guess I just sort of learned that like celebrities are people, you know. Yeah. And like looking back on it, 
particularly with Robin Williams after, you know, he took his life and stuff. Like, it's, I, I know that there was other things going on there too, but yeah, it's intense and they deserve to be treated, you know, like human beings and not yeah. like objects that are like, that boost your ego up or make you feel a certain way. So anyway, kind of a sad yeah. party story. But no, no. I, I think it's more sad for like the, the restaurant to, I'm sure, you know, we've seen people freak out in front of celebrities, but you know, the way you navigated it and the way you delivered that note, like, yeah, of course the agent's going to go, okay, or whatever, bye bye. Uh, but you approached it in a way that if he, if he had read that note, uh, cause we don't know if he did or not that at least he would see that as, okay, you know, she didn't want to bother me. That's more delightful than this pair of jackasses, you know, approaching me. And for, for you as well, like, if I had that experience and I hadn't taken that chance and then he passed, I would regret it for the rest of my life. You know, you, you, you took that, you took that chance and uh, you're right. Like, yeah, celebrities do want to be treated as, as people. And it's funny once you're on set with them, they are just people. And, you know, you kind of, I, I, I find my moment whenever I work with somebody I look up to and I just say like, after a, a shot is, commenced and we like high five and say hey you know thank you for this project and it's usually one they completely forgot about like holy shit you saw that and it's just it's an immediate connection so uh yeah i wouldn't say it's sad at all i i actually i really like that story because you were you know i i don't know about the listeners but i could see myself doing that sitting at the table like oh my god just breathe how do i say it yeah those guys are saying shit oh this is gonna be great but um no (laughs) no you I love that story, man. Honestly, like it, it makes me kind of teary eyed thinking about it because of, you know, not only what he was going through internally, but you know, what, what little notes like that probably meant to him when people didn't say anything. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't, you just never know, you know, how things are received. But I mean, yeah. I, my intentions were clear in the sense of like, I didn't even meet him. You know, I was just like, yeah. here's this thing I want him to know by. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You weren't leaving a note saying, hey, Robin, uh, Flubber 2, uh, are you casting? Is it happening? What's, what's going <laughs> yeah. on here? Uh, yeah. But that goes really well with uh, one of the last questions I have. And it's if you have any advice for, you know, those who are trying to get into this industry, those who maybe are are in it and are trying to stay in it. Do you have anything that you've personally utilized that you could pass on to our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I feel like my sort of story of like taking a break from acting and coming back to it um, is like a lesson in and of itself. Like, you know, don't hold it too tightly. Hmm. Don't. Um, Because it's just a job. And even if you love it, like have other stuff going on, you know, have other things in your life that matter to you um, so so that it can hold, you know, it always holds a place of prominence in your life, but if it's not working out for, cause you know, this, in, this, it ebbs and careers in this, in this, they ebb and flow. And so someone who's really successful could have a whole year where they don't book a single thing. And if they let that get to them, um, then then that's, that's how you end up leaving. But if you stick with it, you see that that actually, it's just, that's your down year. And then you have an up year and then, you know, or whatever the, the, it looks like. So have other things going on so that when you have a, a, a down period, um, you're not at a loss for meaning or, or what to do, you know, um, don't hold it tightly. Don't, don't make it precious, you know? Um, and I, and then, yeah, train, always be training. Never think that you're done because you're not. So just always be, always be training. And, um, what else? have you know community like I, I think again just sort of my theme I guess this podcast is people are the most important thing so um tr- you know treat treat people like you would want to be tra- you know this is all the obvious stuff but I think it's it is the, the important stuff in this career is make it about other people make it about giving something as opposed to needing to, and taking you know make it about giving something back um and then and then trust, I think, making sure that, you know, like, here's this thing. And now, like, 
and then like surrender that, which is obviously easier said than done. Um, yeah. And then I, I guess the last thing too would be, um, treat it like a business Hmm. because it is, I think that was my, uh, part of my downfall was that I was treating it just like this art that was the most important art and my form of expression and my, my everything and all this. And I just love to act. And why can't I just act? And all I want to do is act. Um, but acting is actually like, just like a small part of it in terms of really having it be something sustainable. Um, and so that, that would be, I think my biggest piece of advice is arm yourself with knowledge and think of it like arming yourself because it's a tool and it's also like a protect it's protection, you know, like you are going to give yourself the ability to withstand more if the more that, you know, you know, and, and don't just trust one source of knowledge, like get it, go everywhere and then see what gets reflected back. That's the same. And then trust that. Um, and, and know that it's a business, you know, like I, I having now been a, a nine to five worker, <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, like, there's a bottom line here. And you have to make a certain amount of money in order to justify this. And here's the budget for this. And I really want to do this. But we, you know, it's going to take nine months, because that's the way business works sometimes. And, and also, especially for entrepreneurs, like, mm think about an entrepreneur in anything besides acting and the amount of hustle that is involved to work up like a client base to get a customer base that continues to come back to you that has word of mouth and spreads the news about your product or whatever you're selling it's like a 10-year thing it's 10 years before you have that traction where there's that like um like that sort of flow state of like okay now things now we're now we're moving now we're chugging along 10 years, you know, most, most of the time. And the same is true of acting. Like you have to just like take, take loss after loss after loss, not be profit positive, you know, to use that sort of analogy, but like that is being an entrepreneur period. And, you know, it it, it happens to be acting, but like, I think, I think you have to see it through that mindset of Mm. business because then it allows you to sort of brush things off and be like, yeah, it's business. So this year, and it's like, you know, what are your numbers? You know, like, here's your metrics. Okay. My percentage, I would like to increase my percentage of bookings to audition ratio. Like let's yeah. treat it like it business so that it's not this ethereal thing that we don't have control of. It's something that like we have agency over and that, that we can decide and, and be like, Oh, well, I don't seem to be doing well on this type of thing. So let me work on that. Like not being afraid of what you're bad at, you know? Mm-hmm. And sort of digging into it, and sort of tangenting. But anyway, that's my advice. Be a be a bit be a business person. Be a businesswoman or a businessman. Yeah, well, it's it's all it's all very tangible advice. Like everything you just said is what everyone needs to know, and it's things we are learning in class. You know, it's it's. Uh, I think the most um, pertinent part for those already acting is definitely looking at your ratio of booking and not booking, looking at the percentage and. You you hit the nail on the head. Stop looking at it at this as this like ethereal lottery winning thing, and try to find like the money ball aspect of it and what you can do. Totally agree with it. And yeah, I I don't know. I I can <laughs> I can feel the passion ruminating off of you that we all share about this business. It's it's a whole new level of nerddom. I never thought we would experience <laughs> as actors, and now you're like. Dude, bring out the Excel sheet. I want to see it. I want to see like what are your bookings? What are your losses? And it's yeah, it's so important. Um, I do. Uh, I mean, of course, I'm going to promote uh, Knuckle Pups, but I wanted to ask you if there's anything that you'd like to give a shout out or a promo to. Uh, could be you know a project you are working on. It could be charity you care about, an organization. Um. Okay. So I don't. I I'll have to like maybe message you later to give you the exact instagram handle um but and you know obviously you don't need to always just search on instagram but i did find a couple of accounts that i really appreciate that have really unbiased news about what's happening in iran right now in terms of um just sort of this humanitarian crisis this 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 feminist crisis and um what's going on over there and i think a lot of it is 
is sort of some of it gets to us, you know, but I think mm -hmm. that it's really important that we look at what's going on over there. Um, some of these videos, like these specific uh, profiles I'm thinking of, which I'll send to you later, they're a bit graphic. Like it's, it's, you know, it's what is happening. It's video. It's just like video that's caught. It's very like gorilla feeling. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to watch. Um, but I think it's important that we see that that's happening. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you those. I can't, I can't think yeah. of them, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. Send me those accounts for sure. That's, um, there's been a, a whole new level of support that I, I never foresaw like through this podcast for that, for the news coming out of there and, and it being an accurate um, delivery of current events over there. So yeah, send me that, the the profiles and everything. Cause that's, that'll be in the shadows and promotions. Cause we need to, we need to get the ball rolling there. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that. Because uh, you know, you know, the news here in the States, it's like, ah, here's a bad thing. But anyway, housing crisis. You're like, yeah, yeah, okay, we get it. <laughs> like, let's go back to the other thing that's really important. <laughs> yeah, and I think it feels like for me, like I'll I'll see a friend or someone in my in my community post something, and it oftentimes feels like I I did my part. I made a post, uh, um, which is better than nothing. Yeah. But at the same time, I I don't know. I just I feel like um. There's more. Yeah. There's always more we can do, right? So yeah, yeah. Oh no, I I appreciate that. Um, the <laughs> there's like there's no way of segueing that into the last thing that we do in this podcast. No, it's not a bad thing at all. It's like, uh, I always think of it like um, you know, trying to do stand up comedy after somebody delivered breaking news about something really terrible. <laughs> like, and now here comes this guy. Like, hey, how's everyone doing? shit um <laughs> but this is um this is our uh our awkward goodbye uh so i i ask everybody this and more often than not it's a no but have you seen wayne's world yes but like you know a long time so okay all right well you're a lot closer than most people you know who you are the former guests uh <laughs> but there's a segment in the film where one of the leads uh disbands from their live radio show because a new producer took it over and now dana carpy playing garth is now stuck on set as they're filming looking to the lens of the camera mumbling nonsense because he's feel he feels so awkward about what's going on uh so essentially i'm going to give you a three two one countdown and when i point give me your best verbal awkward goodbye and i'll stop the recording from there okay Does sound good yeah. <laughs> okay buddy here we go in So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.